Our modern understanding of the dynamic and varying nature of the seafloor is a recent achievement. Less than 200 years ago, the bottom of the ocean was widely believed to be a featureless expanse of mud and sediments. Of course, sailors have been measuring water depths since we took to the seas thousands of years ago because water depth and bottom composition are essential for navigation, allowing sailors to avoid hazards and look for hints that they may be approaching land. But before the 20th century, measuring water depth required dropping a weighted line to the bottom. This is called taking a sounding. It is fairly straightforward in shallow water, but becomes more difficult as the water gets deeper. In deep water, challenges to overcome include drifting as any lateral displacement or sag in the line results in an overestimation of depth. Also, the amount of line required to reach the bottom increases with depth. At some point, the weight of the line is significant enough that it becomes difficult to even tell when the falling weight hits bottom. Navigational accuracy is also essential for mapping as even a reasonable estimate of depth is of little value if the navigator has no way of determining the location of the sounding. The necessary navigational accuracy became possible in the 1700s with the development of lunar distance techniques and the invention of the chronometer. By the early 1800s, chronometers were in relatively wide use, allowing more and more ships to take soundings in the open ocean. Early solutions to addressing errors introduced by drift and the weight of the line involved marking the line at set intervals and allowing the weight to drop to the bottom as fast as possible. As the weight fell, the marks were counted. The weight was assumed to have hit bottom when the line's speed suddenly increased. Once the weight hit bottom, sailors could hoist the line in, taking up slack and positioning the ship so that the line was as close to vertical as possible. Early versions of these methods required a great deal of attention over an extended period because in deep water the weight could take an hour or more to reach the bottom, and an accurate count of the marks had to be maintained the entire time. A significant advancement in sounding methods occurred in the 1870s when William Thompson, the future Lord Kelvin, developed a system that dropped a much heavier weight held by piano wire. This wire was fed off a large spool with a measuring wheel that automated measuring the line as the weight fell. Combining soundings along paths that ships sailed with good navigational data allowed explorers to develop maps of the general bathymetry of the seafloor. By the mid-19th century, numerous soundings were combined to create rough maps of ocean basins, such as this one first published by Murray in his textbook on general oceanography. Because of the relative ease of taking soundings near shore and the value of maps for hazard mitigation in shallow water, much of the world's coastal regions had been mapped by the end of the 19th century. Many deep sea soundings had also been taken primarily by commercial surveyors working to identify paths for telegraph cables. But due to the time-consuming nature of mechanical sounding methods and the vast area covered by the oceans, large portions of the Earth's surface remained unmapped. Tools for mapping the seafloor took a giant leap forward at the beginning of the 20th century, when the sinking of the Titanic by an iceberg in 1912 and the advent of submarine warfare in World War I stimulated the development of echo sounders as a way to identify underwater hazards. Above the water, Navigation and mapping are possible using visible light and other forms of electromagnetic energy because these forms of radiation travel great distances in air. Electromagnetic energy is less useful underwater as it is rapidly scattered and absorbed by water. Sound, on the other hand, can travel long distances underwater, a fact known since at least Leonardo da Vinci's time in the 15th century. Echo sounders are a type of sonar, which stands for sound, navigation, and ranging. Echo sounders use transducers to generate and receive acoustic signals. Measuring the time taken for a sound wave to return from a reflected surface allows ships to estimate the distance to that reflecting surface. With good data about the speed sound travels in water under various conditions, this method can provide detailed information about seafloor's depth, structure, and composition. The range of frequencies for this type of mapping is generally between 100 and 500 kilohertz, but can be as low as 10 kilohertz. There is a trade-off between range and resolution, with higher frequencies providing higher resolution, but covering a lower range. Since higher frequencies don't travel as far, deep-sea mapping requires the use of frequencies at the lower end of this range. 
Early equipment sent a narrow beam of sound which mapped a relatively narrow strip under the ship's path. By the mid-1970s, multi-beam echo sounders which sent out a cone or fan-shaped beam allowed larger swaths of the seafloor to be mapped with each pass. And while multi-beam sonar is still the best way to get detailed information about the seafloor's depth and structure, it is a laborious and time-consuming process. As of 2019, only about 15% of the ocean bottom has been directly observed using sonar. With only 15% of the seafloor mapped by sonar, the ocean bathymetry shown on sites like Google Earth are based on satellite data. To the unaided eye, the ocean surface may look flat, but it is not. Beginning in the 1970s, scientists began using satellite-mounted altimeters to map variations in ocean elevation by bouncing microwaves off the surface. By collecting multiple samples over long periods, noise from waves, currents, and tidal activity can be subtracted away to reveal the mean sea surface over large regions. These mean sea surface maps revealed broad bumps, dips, and ridges that matched the mountains, valleys, and slopes of the seafloor. By correlating the large area altimetry data to available sounding and sonar data, oceanographers have been able to produce maps of the seafloor. However, satellite-based bathymetry is relatively low resolution when compared to sonar data. So, there are many ongoing efforts to increase the coverage of sonar-based maps. As efforts to broaden sonar coverage continue, the global coverage provided by satellite-based maps aid in navigation, hazard mitigation, and environmental conservation, because seafloor structure is a primary determinant of species distribution, allowing environmental managers to develop basic habitat maps and prioritize areas for conservation efforts. The maps also have economic value because the general geography of an area is a predictor of the presence of economically valuable resources. If you found this video helpful, please consider sharing it and giving it a thumbs up. Feel free to comment with any questions or suggestions, and if you want to keep up with the content here at Science Primer, click the subscribe button. Thank you for watching.